Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, my name's Heather Henry. I am a, a registered nurse, Queen's nurse, honorary senior lecturer at the University of Salford, and many other roles. But I am interested in people, communities, and well-being. And welcome to our seventh meeting of the Health Relation Academic Network with Dr. Robin Farrow, who I'll introduce in a minute. And um, you can find out more about Health Creation Academic Network on the website, uh, hcan.uk, YouTube, just look up Health Creation Academic Network, and the snappily titled at hcan2787 on Twitter. Thank you, Twitter, for that. This is informal, it's about making relationships and connections and it's about ex exchanging information about what makes us well, rather than what prevents us from being ill. That idea of um, Aaron, Aaron Antonovsky, for instance, having a sense of coherence, um, that idea that we need um, connections in our lives, we have a need of meaning to get up in the morning, about understanding how our communities tick, which is what we'll be particularly talking about this morning. Um, that sort of thing and thinking about well what is it that we're teaching our students so for instance in nursing it's very much a biomedical model and how do we move that towards also having a more social understanding of how our new graduates might come into the community and practice more effectively to not only cure folk make them make them better but also enable them to live the best lives that they can. So this session is all about what undergraduate health and care students and beyond, such as housing or policing, know about ethnography and anthropology. To get the best out of this meeting, uh, it's best not to um, use jargon or, or abbreviations. If you can avoid that, just explain what you mean. Um, uh, introduce yourselves in the chats, introduce yourself when you speak. Um, it's informal, there's going to be plenty of time for questions and relationship building. And the underlying question for us is at the end, what should we be teaching undergraduates about focusing on people's strengths and helping them to live their best lives? And uh, Dr. Robin Farrow, He's pioneered the use of anthropological and ethnographic techniques in applied research and innovation settings. And after his PhD in anthropology of Chinese leadership in 2004, he founded a multiple award-winning research agency specializing in the use of the me these methods in the UK and beyond. He's the founder of Encounter Consulting, which focuses on research, strategy and transformation in local government and public service policy. Robin worked alongside Wigan Council to develop the deal, an informal agreement between the council and everyone who lives and works there to work together to create a better borough. And this was a major six year process that you can read about all over the King's Fund website. Um, involving moving towards asset-based working at scale, empowering communities through a citizen-led approach to public health and creating a culture which permits staff to redesign how they work in response to the needs of individuals and communities. And as a result of implementing the deal, healthy life expectancy in Wigan increased significantly. Booking the trend from stagnation and can be seen in England-wide figures. I'm going to uh, do what I usually do when I do these things, which is I'm going to throw out a bunch of stuff and I'm happy to uh, take questions on any, any aspect of any, anything that I say. Um, and part of the reason I'm just going to throw out a bunch of stuff is because I know that there'll be people with different levels of interest in different parts of it. And, and if I just stuck to one thing, I'd be doing a disservice so I'm going to try and yeah I'm going to try and sort of splatter a lot at you um, I'm also going to do something odd which I haven't done before um, 
I'm going to start at the end. So I was involved with Wigan and what I'm going to show you, the, the, the Wigan process is, you know, 10 years um, in the making now. And I am a key part of the, the, the Wigan process. Um, and I understand you've had a talk from Donna Hall, um, who was the chief exec, who made the deal happen. But my involvement with Wigan actually predates even Donna. Um, the, the, the project that she was talking about with Nesta actually started before she was chief exec. And I was there right in the ground floor. But what I'm going to show you is something that actually just it, it recently ceased to exist. But it's a, a video of, um, I think it's called the Healthy Wigan Partnership. And this is the training facility that they built um, in Wigan Town Centre. I'm going to show you the video and then I'm going to kind of rewind and tell you how it, how it got to that point. Um, I'm, I'm hoping Donna didn't show you this video. No. Okay, good. Welcome to our deal for a healthier Wigan. This is an interactive training experience specially designed for our workforce to build on our borough's strengths. In under 12 months we've welcomed over 1,300 health and care staff with a range of skills and backgrounds across multiple organisations, learning about conversations which matter and working together. Each session is led by volunteer hosts from across the partnership, using a range of innovative learning approaches and bringing real scenarios to life. My name's Helen Hinzel and I'm the team leader for the Children's Audiology Service in the Wigan Borough and I'm also a host for the Healthier Wigan Partnerships training and what I've really enjoyed about it so far is meeting lots of different people and finding out from them about how they already are working in an asset-based way and hearing all the good examples that people have to offer about how they're working. We want to make a difference to the lives of people we talk to every day, like Tony. Uh, my name's Tony, I've lived in Wigan all my life. Uh, about five years ago I had an accident which affected me physically and mentally. And I went visiting my doctor and uh, was prescribed antidepressants because I was that low. I'd go for walks, I, I wouldn't think nothing of like walking 10 miles a day. Just to get away, I just couldn't keep still. Anyway, after a while she put me in touch with a community link worker, Debbie. And Debbie said, what are you interested in? Well, I like writing, so uh, she put me in touch with Sunshine House Writing Group. Since then, I've progressed. Uh, I can even get up now and go on stage and do readings. And it's changed my life a lot. And now, thankfully, I'm free of medication. I don't take medication. I get by in my writing and people I meet now and do my stand-up like, so. Hi, I'm Louise. Uh, I'm a poet and I teach creative writing at a community centre called Sunshine House. Um, I've been working with Tony for just over a year probably, so when we started to do our public readings at first um, he wouldn't read, he would just watch and then slowly he got the confidence to get up and um, read a little bit of his own work and then he really began to progress and uh, would take part in other people's like comedy scripts and we began to see the real Tony, like a happy healthy Tony. For us, this experience is about connecting and developing our valued workforce so they can support local people to build their own resilience in their own way. Hi, I'm Jen and I've attended the Deal for Healthy Work and Partnership training today. It's been absolutely fantastic, I've really enjoyed it. It's been great listening to other colleagues who work across a variety of different organisations uh, and how we're going to apply the principles of the deal. Okay, so obviously that's a kind of corporate video and, and um, I, I, they all have a kind of generic kind of feel to them. But what's interesting to me about seeing that, and I don't, I don't know, Heather, is that the training that you went through? Did you go to that facility? Ooh, yeah, I, I, I went to um, some training in Tilsley and had my uh, conversation, different conversation training and um, I did the whole nine yards where you're advised to go out into the community and have a different conversation. And yep. I went to Pets at Home, uh, which is nearby, <laughs> and um, had a conversation with one of the um, guys there. And I was amazed about how quickly um, I got into a conversation with him about some of the difficulties he was having with his 10 children 
seeing his <laughs> 10 children. And this was ironic because only a few miles away in Salford, I was working with um, Salford Dads on a very well-known project. And uh, he was saying more or less exactly the same thing as the dads down the road were saying. And I did try and put him in touch with them, but there's something about boundaries between <laughs> between yep. Wigan, and, Wigan and Salford. And um, yeah, um, it was fairly transformational. And, and as you probably know by now, Robin, I mm. was working in Eccles after that and um, couldn't get the fathers there to talk. So I sat myself in a pub for about four mm. months and pretty soon found out what was going exactly what was going on in, in that community as a result. Yeah, great. I mean, great stuff. So that that's the um, the training facility that Wigan built. But like I say, that was about that was built, I think, sort of seven, eight years after we started the whole process. So now I'm going to rewind. I'm going to take you back to where this all started. The, the thing that's really interesting about that video for me, just for me, is the use of all these terms like asset based link worker, the, the mention of Sunshine House. None of these terms really existed um, when we started all this. Lots of them have become um, ubiquitous now, especially especially that term asset based. Um, we we uh, but I'll, I'll tell you the story of how that all all came about. Okay, um, I've just realised I've got the same front. Here we go. Okay, you can all see my PowerPoint, I presume. Can you still see my PowerPoint? No, I've made it go big. Yes. Yeah, great. Okay, so um, a quick bit of background on who I am. Um, so I, actually I wear a number of hats and I do a number of different things and I work for something called Future Agenda, which does um, foresight. What will the world look like in 10 years time? Um, Bite-sized summary, not that great um, is the answer to that question. Um, but I also work, I work in commercial market research, and then I have this whole uh, tranche of work where I work with uh, public sector and local authorities. Um, I'm an anthropologist by training. Um, anthropology is the key word here, um, and it, it, it's what gives rise to ethnography, but I'll come back to that in a sec. Um, I was part of the Wigan deal. Um, Donna always says, you know, I, I did so much in the, the Wigan deal, I would throw that right back and say the, the Wigan deal is Donna's. Um, and, and actually uh, the, the director of adult social care in Wigan, they really did the deal. Uh, I think I, my role in the whole thing was as a catalyst. So I helped things change and I, I, I created some direction, but not by design. I, did, I will tell you the story of it um, uh, and why it is that, that, that Donna always speaks about me when doing this. And, and I suppose the third thing is that I, I guess um, in, in all public services, there is this need for transformation right now. There was 10 years ago, austerity was kind of uh, uh, the, the burning platform that made, that kick-started certain kinds of transformation across different kinds of public service. Um, local authorities are all trying to transform in one way or another. Every, everywhere has its own reform agenda, its transformation agenda and what have you. Um, and, and actually the, the burning platforms might be money, but it might also be, I, I would suggest, that we we now have new kinds of burning platforms as well. I mean, climate change, obviously, but um, but things like the, the the datafied world we live in are also creating new needs for rapid change. Um, and I guess that's where I come in as well because I'm, I'm I'm using certain things uh, to try and create change. I'm going to leave that hanging and and just go back to first principles for a moment. So. When you, when you heard from Donna before, what you'll have heard is that there was this thing called Creative Councils, created by Nesta, which is a, a national lottery endowment um, in, in London that does innovation largely in the public sector or funds um, innovation. It doesn't do it itself. Um, and I, as part of that, Wigan, Wigan entered this Creative Councils program and they did very well and they got through to the later stages. And one of the sort of prizes, if you like, was that they were given expert time that was funded by Nesta. And just the, the way this happened to fall out, Nesta gave, gave me as a resource to Wigan. Um, and I, I could go and spend, I don't know, 10, 15 days up there, um, paid for by Nesta. And my job at that time was to do some research on what, what we called the Skulls Project, which was to look at a local area and um, 
look at its suitability for um, an innovative idea that Wigan had at the time to do with creating its own currency and putting it, pushing out personal budgets in the form of a Wigan pound, which people could spend on an e-marketplace to buy locals, to buy low-level social care services from friends and neighbours instead of from a large social care provider. No, none of this ever happened. Um, but I was I was sent up to go and look at the community and look at the capacity for people to to help each other within a community to to deliver these kinds of services the, the capacity for volunteering effectively and for being able to do uh, the kinds of things that you know low level adult social care services or like going shopping for somebody or uh, helping them across the you know help, helping them get to a community center whatever whatever it might be. Um, and I went and did this research and uh, I used my, my own research methods at the time. I ran a research company um, and um, we got to a point in that research, there's, there's a longer story around it all, but we got to a point um, in that research where I said, um, I need some more people. And I, I said to Wigan, I can use the, the people in my company if you like, um, and it will cost X thousand pounds and they can come up and we'll complete this research project. And Wigan said bluntly, we don't have X thousand pounds. And, and I was like, fair enough. Um, how about you give me a couple of social workers? Um, because social workers have many of the same skills that researchers have in terms of their ability to communicate with people. Um, they aren't researchers, and I don't think you should confuse the two. But I, I, I said, if you give me a couple of social workers, I will train them to be researchers and they can come and work with me. So Wigan, Julie gave me three social workers and I put them through actually a three day training uh, to train them up to be um, ethnographic researchers. I'll come back to what that is. So I wanted uh, uh, to, to make them into mini me's effectively to go out and help me do this community research. So a three days intense training. Um, and the idea was that I would then leave the council with this capacity to do community research afterwards. That was the idea. And, and I would get my research project completed. And what happened is that those three social workers, long after that project finished, I'd gone back to London, um, thought that it was all finished. I get a call from the director of adult social care and he says, uh, Robin, what have you done to my social workers? Um, and I was like, I'm sorry, I don't know. And he's like, no, no, no. I want all my social workers to work like, like that. And I didn't know at this point what they were doing because I had trained them solely for a research purpose and I had fulfilled my brief and, and gone home. Um, but effectively, the, the director of adult social care said, we need to do this training across the entirety of the social, social work workforce. And now I'm going to skip some steps. So we trained the whole of the social work uh, workforce um, across adults. Um, and then he decided, actually, um, this didn't make any sense for just them to know it. So we need all the partners. We need all the back office staff. They had a, a, a role called brokers. They all need to go through this training. So we redevised the training. We sent them, and we're talking hundreds of people going through this training, which by this point had been adapted and transformed. Um, and then um, what, what they realized was if they're going to use the methods that I had trained them in, don't worry, I'll come back to what all this is in a minute. If, I, if they're going to use the methods that I've trained them in to do social care, um, then the back office needs to change. The whole IT infrastructure needs to change. Everything needs to change. Um, and that's, th this is the genesis of the deal, is that um, we started off by teaching people some skills, then they tried to implement them. And the implication is you now must change all the way, all the systems within that, within which they're working um, because we're elevating these new skills beyond just a, a nice to have and becoming and making it the way that we now deliver social care. And, um, and then Donna, Donna sort of caught wind of all this and Donna's like, we need the whole council. We need the whole council to be working in this way. And we expanded the training beyond adult social care into children's. I ended up doing innovation workshops with um, uh, environmental services and all across the council. And this is what the deal became. Now the outward facing part of the deal is this stuff about freezing the council tax and doing recycling, that's to citizens. But what people often miss is that the real deal, deal the real transformation was a whole council transformation internally 
And by that, I mean people being fired, people being hired, job descriptions being rewritten, departments being created, other departments being let go, total transformation. And whenever I say this, people say that, yeah, but that didn't really happen. And then they hear Donna speak and they think, oh, it's just the chief exec talking big. It, that, that's a complete misunderstanding. Wigan transformed every single aspect of what they did. And they are, to this day, totally different to every other council. People go and work there. They know it's different. You don't, you don't go to Wigan Council and, and work there and come out thinking it's just like every other council. It isn't. It changed everything. And that's why it took seven, seven eight years. Okay. So I'm going to go back a bit. So I went up and I did this training for people. And you've got to remember, at this point, I'm thinking sort of semi-academically, if you like, about the way that I'm treat, um, teaching these social workers. And I'm teaching them some fundamentals about anthropology um, and ethnography. What you'll see here is this is a really simple representation of something called an anthropological triangle. There are many. This is one. This is one I like to use, which just shows you there is essentially the discipline of anthropology. Um, which I'm not going to go into in great detail. And then there are two aspects um, that, that complement that discipline. One is field work, which is where anthropologists go into the field and they, they explore, they observe, they live with people, they do research with people. And then there's ethnography, which is the bit where all of the, the, the research they've done gets written up and presented back to someone. So that's the anthropological triangle, okay? And there are many questions you might have about this. One big misunderstanding that has happened since um, people like me brought anthropology out of academia and into the, the real world, if you like, is that people now mistake ethnography for fieldwork. So the term ethnography gets used to describe the fieldwork part. What makes anthropology different to the other, it's, it's the third of the three social sciences, the other two being sociology and psychology, what makes it different is the fieldwork method. What anthropologists do is they go and they immerse in people's lives. They spend time in people's lives. They don't do surveys. They don't use uh, focus groups. They go and they live with people. Um, uh, there's a lot that could be said about that and how it's done and how you are trained up to, to do the kinds of things that anthropologists do. Um, and I'll call it ethnography from now on. In reality, we call it field work. Ethnography is the bit where you're kind of translating what you've seen back to a different audience. Um, so I'm, and I'm actually teaching this to people when, when I do this, but let's, you, ooh, let's use the... Uh, this term ethnography, I just want to demythologize it a little bit because it sounds long and it sounds like it's a, a crazy word. There's this, there's this whole idea that ethnography is new and it's new in public services. And actually there's a government website which talks about ethnography as if it's this new tool. I just want to be very clear. It's very old. It's been around a long time. Anthropology is an established social science that, that was founded at exactly the same time as sociology and psychology were 150 years ago. And the term ethnography simply means, the left part, ethno, just means people, culture, and graphy means writing, right? So ethnography is writing about culture. That's what the term means. Don't worry about it. it, it incidentally, ethno does not mean ethnicity in this context. It's just talking about people and culture. So culture writing, that is what ethnography is. Now, this whole thing about anthropologists uh, going and immersing in people's lives and um, deploying a, sorry, give me one second, I'm just going to, sorry. <laughs> um, this whole uh, methodology whereby people go into people's lives and immerse in them and spend time in their lives has a lot of implications academically and a lot of implications for research. It means you get data in a completely different way so if you, if you wanted to research with a community and you went out with a survey, you will get your data back, for example, in a list um, according to the questions that you ask. You, you might ask people, how, you know, how many people live in your household? And you will get a list of numbers, three, four, five, six, whatever. And then you can take those numbers and you can average them. None of that happens in ethnography. What happens in ethnography or when, when you're going out in, into the field is that you, you get data and it comes at you at, in unpredictable ways, in all kinds of orders. Imagine if I go and 
I, I, this is real. So I, last year I went and worked with um, people with multiple complex needs in Birmingham. So I spent the day on the streets with some with, with a homeless man. Now I have no idea what he's going to say to me. I have no idea what I'm going to see. All of this is unpredictable but I'm also getting a real deep insight into his life. There are ways of asking questions and what have you, which I do not have time to go through um, today. And those are the methods that I teach, but I just want you to grasp onto this idea that what the anthropologist is trying to do is immerse in people's lives, right? And get in, get, the way we put it is we're trying to understand the world from the native's point of view. And by native, we mean people who are native in that environment. So we want to understand the world from the natives point of view what does the world look like through their eyes not how do we interpret what they're doing how do they interpret what they're doing that that's the idea of, of anthropology and this is what i was teaching these social workers um, in order to come and do the research for me there was uh, an amazing um thing told to me um by a very famous anthropologist in who's at cambridge university called marilyn strathern she said Ethnography, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, so she's talking about the field work. Ethnography has one trick up its sleeve. It anticipates a future need to know something that cannot be defined in the present. Now, for those of you who've done any research in your life, this is devastating for other research methods, what she's saying here. And I'm gonna try and explain it as, as succinctly as I can. She's saying, what, what, is it, what is it that makes ethnography special? Why is this going and immersing in people's lives so different to doing surveys or a focus group or an engagement exercise? Why is it so different? Why? Because you predetermine nothing, but you assume there must be something important that you need to find out. You just don't know what it is yet. Now, if you're devising a survey for, for, to do engagement, for example, what you are really doing in that survey is trying to second guess what the best question is to ask people. So you, it might be, you know, in the asset based approach, it might be um, what are the kinds of things that you are most passionate about? We are already presuming that there are things that are passionate, that people are passionate about when you ask that question. Ethnography doesn't do that. It just anticipates that there will be a brilliant question to ask, but you don't know what it is yet. It will only come to you when you're in the field, when you're with people. So that's what she's trying to say. I'll just say it again. So ethnography has one trick up its sleeve. It anticipates a future need to know something that cannot be defined in the present. And what you will find is that every other research method, social research method, engagement method, does in fact try to define things before you get to the the, the the field if you like i only present this as this is the difference this is what i'm teaching when i'm teaching social workers i'm te teaching social workers put aside your assessment forms imagine that your assessment form tells you a bunch of stuff that you think you need to know put them aside we'll get you out there trying to get into the mindset of they'll teach you what you need to know the people that you're working with so this is the this is how, how the training was born so i start off teaching people about ethnography and anthropology and the research method. And, and I'm getting them to the point that they can use these anthropological principles to in, in social work practice. Now, when we, when we tried to start, obviously you cannot talk at this level necessarily with all people across the local authority. I can't necessarily give a, a long lecture about anthropology and ethnography to everybody. So what, what we did was try to develop a language around it that would make sense for, for a wider audience of people. And, and the first way that I put it is it's a new kind of engagement. I mean, Donna also refers to it as um, a new kind of social contract and, you know, the relationship between citizen and state. And I'm, I'm fine with that, too. But the user friendly way of putting this is it's a new kind of engagement. So forget what you've been doing with all your kind of community engagement exercises and your patient feedback exercises. I'm going to reformulate this and talk about a new kind of engagement which is modeled on ethnography but we don't have to use the word ethnography just think of it new kind of engagement and how what 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 does this new kind of engagement look like well we can talk about ethnographic techniques and what have you but why why not just call it a different conversation okay um and that was what um the director of adult social care called a lot of my kind of anthropological jargon he's like let's just call it a different conversation it's an easier way of presenting to people look all we're talking about here really is having a conversation with people on their terms 
right? That, that, that's all it means. It means put away your assessment forms, put away your biomedical thinking if you're a nurse, put away your um, social care thinking if you're a social worker, put away whatever your kind of institutional um, uh, baggage is, just put it away for a moment and just have a conversation with people. That's a very simple way of, of explaining what the ethnographic uh, experience is like. In fact, uh, anthropologists call it the ethnographic encounter, hence my business being called Encounter Consulting. And when we do the training now, what, what's really interesting, I, I, I said um, the, the way that we trained those social workers was a uh, kind of three day intensive training. Well, that's not practical to roll out with a whole council. So we kind of distilled down and distilled down what the components of that training. And what's really interesting is that that training had some very practical aspects. Um, so bits where I was literally getting into the nitty gritty of social work practice or uh, community nursing practice, you know, that, literally talking to them about um, how to go into people's houses and how, you know, how to start a conversation. And over time, as we had to pair the training back in time, so we had to make it a shorter training, we asked people, which are the bits that you really want? Which are the bits that you want to keep? What, what, what bits of this training are you learning most from? Which bits are influencing your practice the most? And what's really surprising is that it was this bit. And I understand for everyone who has not been through the training that that picture doesn't make any sense. And that's great. Um, this is the kind of picture that gets shown to every anthropological and every anthropology student when they start their university courses at University of Manchester or University of Cambridge, whatever it happens to be. This is the kind of slide they'll get shown and they'll get told all about the newer people of Sudan. And my training had a whole section on this because I use it to make a, a bunch of points about what field work is like and how a field worker engages with a, a kind of group of people that they have that's, that's unfamiliar, a different culture. And that's the bit that social workers wanted to keep. I, the reason I'm emphasizing this point is that whenever I talk through how this training works, with people, they're like, oh, our social workers won't want that. They'll want the really practical stuff, the stuff that really helps them in the day. And I'm, I'm here to tell you that is not what they wanted. They wanted this completely different, completely new way of thinking about how to um, uh, examine culture, how to explore people, how to find out the deep things about what they do, what they believe, how they behave. Um, and they wanted the real anthropological theory and that remained in the training. I, I'm, I'm fascinated to know, Heather, how much get, got pulled through because I don't deliver the training in Wigan anymore. Um, but, um, but my understanding is that they still do try to use this, even though it's gone through, you know, I trained a trainer who's trained a trainer who's trained a trainer. And it's, you know, it's gone a long way beyond me. But my understanding is they've kept this part in. And I think the reason it works is because it's new and different. Um, and, and exciting to hear. And the, the key points of all this for me is that I try to teach these various anthropological principles about how you explore people, how you uh, immerse in their lives. And, and I've told you one of them already, this idea of understanding the native's point of view. So trying to see the world through the eyes of the people that you're working with, this idea of immersion in their lives. And, and I, like th I like this phrase, being there as it happens. In other words, if somebody says to you, I don't like, I, I, let's say, I don't like doing my physiotherapy in the park. Well, that's fine. But why not go to the park with them, having built trust with them and learn why it is they don't like doing their physiotherapy in the park? Let, let's find out why, because God knows why it is. Maybe it's because pigeons shit in the place that they do it. Maybe, maybe it's because they're self-conscious. Maybe it's because it's cold. Could be any of these things. Um, but we won't know until we go with them and, and, and experience it with them. Uh, this idea of being holistic, uh, again, I haven't got time to go into exactly what holistic means in this context, but finding out, it essentially means finding out everything about people. Again, take an assessment form and imagine that that constitutes only about a quarter of a percent of someone's life. The anthropologist is interested in the rest of it, all the reasons why they're filling in the assessment form the way they are all the contexts for that. That's what the anthropologist is in. And all of this takes time and time to, to build trust and what have you. Just so that, that there's a lot I understand that, that could be 
asked uh, about all these things. I just want to stress that when we taught all these principles to social workers and people working in social care or, or um, community health care, whatever it may be, the idea is they put all this into practice. Some of them complain that they already do it. They don't, but they, they think they do. Um, uh, the idea is we try and get them to put it into practice. Um, and then they say, well, now I've got all this information about people. Um, where do I put it? Where do I put it? Um, and what happened in Wigan is we went back and we went, okay, the IT system is not set up for this because assessment forms, for example, um, they only allow you to write three lines and then there's a character limit. Well, we're going to have to fix that. So we're going to have to change the way that form works, that, that digital infrastructure. And then they'll say, okay, but now I found out about this person. I found out they don't like going to that bloody day center that we've been sending them to for three years. They actually want to go somewhere else. Well, now we need a system now to say, to do a safeguarding check or a risk assessment on a new kind of place very rapidly. And how do we get them from where they were? We thought the day center was really convenient. Turns out they don't want to go. Now they want to get somewhere that's a little less convenient. How do, do we have a mechanism for getting these? Do you understand what I mean? So what's happening is that by changing the praxis, the practice of, of social work, we've now got to change the whole system behind. And that's how the whole deal thing took off. And when we saw, I mean, yes, a lot of other local authorities are trying to do what Wigan does. And I think they all look for the magic bullet. So people keep asking me, will I go and do, deliver the training and that will transform the council? And I go to them and I say, I'll deliver the training and it will transform nothing. You have to be prepared to change everything that you do, all the, all the systems within which you work in order for this training to take hold and, and to work in a new way. So that's the, that's the Wigan story. It's my version of the Wigan story. And that's how you end up at the training that in the video that, that you saw. That um, facility where you saw that video being made, they made an artificial street with artificial people and artificial stories. And the idea when you do the training is you go and immerse in those people's lives and you try and work out things about them. They actually have actors coming and playing roles so that you can learn how to do uh, ethnography in a safe environment and of course i send people out to do some real ethnography which is this bit where i send people out to have conversations um which everyone is terrified of it's, it's very funny actually you, you can get a room full of social workers and nurses who spend their whole days talking to people that they don't know um and all i do is i strip them of the uniform and i strip them of the context and i say go and do exactly the same thing and they freak out um, and it's it's very interesting to watch a social worker going, I can't do this, I can't do this. And I'm, I point out to them, you're doing it every day. You're just doing it behind the barrier of your uh, local authority title. I'm just taking that away. Yeah, I, I, I was thinking about um, how the students might view this. I'm spending quite a lot of time with student nurses at the moment and they have real confidence issues my other thing is that that they get quite institutionalized quite quickly as well which is why I'm concentrating on undergraduates here so before you get there because they're coming in quite mature now and they start seeing things for the first time quite often um, uh, uh, and then you know it's that um, that idea of um, um, being able to observe more clearly when you're um, when you knew somewhere um, so I try to get them as early as possible as students, but they <clears throat> they really do have problems with being told what to do and exactly how to do it. And I, I do worry about how universities will manage that process because it is quite a an, an open process, isn't it? To to um, have an ethnographic perspective, to also to know where to go. I was told yeah. exactly where to sit in uh, in oh, really? uh yeah the, yeah the the residents I, I throw myself on communities and i just say you know where shall i go what should i do uh, should, where should where should we base ourselves and they went oh you definitely want to be in the Ellesmere it's closed by the way now if you want to try and go um and i was introduced and um i had to be accepted and allowed to be there and all sorts of things like that that Mm -hmm. you know, it's the confidence, really. I, I, yeah. I totally understand that different conversation. I felt like that. There was people really scared to actually leave the building that we were training in. Yes, yeah, yeah. I, it's very interesting. When I do the training, I always say, because I've done it so many times now with hundreds of groups, um, I always say, rather scarily, say, let's say the room has 25 people in it. What, what I say is, 
roughly a third of you will go out and have an amazing conversation and it will be transformational for you. you you'll be amazed at what, what this ethnography thing does. A third of you will have a, a quite a, a, a normal time, if you like. They'll, they'll go somewhere normal and they'll have a normal conversation um, and it won't be scary. And then a third of the room will fail. And they'll fail not because people won't talk to them, but because they'll bottle out of doing it. But what, what's, what's good is that um, when they all come back, the people with the transformational stories almost embarrass the ones who failed by by demonstrating what, what's happened. It's a very powerful um, training tool. And I, just to be clear, I was taught exactly the same way. So when I was at, at university in um, uh, at the LSE and I was doing my ethnographic training, we had to go out, actually, we had to go out for two days and, and go and, and, and make notes and talk to people so is, I, I'm only doing exactly what I've done myself. I'm not <laughs> forcing anyone to do, do anything that I haven't had to do myself. And, and Job is asking about how do we yeah. get training like this? You know, I was fortunate that I was in, invited in by one of the ward councillors who, who knew that I was interested in this stuff. Uh, and I was close enough to Wigan to actually go because I think the training's still going on. They just have cohort, cohort after cohort after cohort of it. They do, yeah. I mean, as far as I understand it, Wigan basically everyone has to do it, um, and any new joiner has to do it. Um, I don't know how they're rolling it out now. I don't know how they've been doing it during um, COVID, but my understanding is that they've lost that facility. Um, and it may be switching to a digital form. I still go and do this training. Um, so I've just delivered a whole um, uh, sequence of them in Berry um, with the adult social care workforce in Berry and, and a lot of uh, nurses in Berry uh, with the senior social worker there. Um, so I'm still doing it in various places. Um, but I, I, what I haven't done is productized it, if you like. So I haven't, um, I haven't created an online resource myself or, um, uh, you know, kind of package. There are a couple of people who are delivering it now who aren't me. Um, uh, and, and I don't know, I, you know, I haven't, I haven't attended their uh, versions. Um, so I don't know how close they do it to the way that I do it. But it, uh, in terms of how, how you can get it, I mean, I guess a, a uh, it, it takes a public sector body that you'd work for to to commission it, basically. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. And I, I'm just wondering for the participants and those watching back, if you were to give a tip to have that sort of conversation, um, you know, how would we how would we have that experience? Because you don't, you know. Um, I, I tend to have it, well, I, I'm, that's just the way I'm built, really. <laughs> I tend to go to places that I've never been, that I'm not native, and to um, sit there quite often, it's cafes and pubs. I don't drink, by the way, when I'm in, in the pub, if the NMC is watching, <laughs> when, I'm, when I'm on duty, as it were. But, um, you know, how do we, how should we start to have, to have this experience? Uh, you mean, are you asking me sort of what, what's the kind of light version that people could implement yeah. for themselves? Yeah, um, yeah. Um, it's, it's a really interesting question. I mean, I do, I do think that you you need a little bit of the of the anthropology, uh, anthropological principles background um, to it, and there are there are some. The, the thing about anthropologists is they don't they never write anything nice and easy. Um, it, so it's quite difficult to access some of this, some of this thought. Um, but I think a, a good way of doing it is to um, find yourself a good anthropological starter bit of reading uh, and read um, a piece of anthropology as written by an anthropologist where they've just done this, where they've done this kind of observation. The most famous one of this, by the way, is, is a piece of writing called um, The Balinese Cockfight. I apologize for the uh, um, funny sounding name, um, about uh, where an anthropologist was writing about cockfighting in Bali. And you, anyone can find this. Um, he was called Clifford Geertz. And you don't have to read it all, but what you can read is his description of this cockfight. And, and how much comes out of that. And I think it, you can, it, obviously it's very exotic to us, a cockfight. It's not particularly exotic to the Balinese, right? So 
what he's doing is just writing about a normal everyday activity. And then you can sort of go and emulate that yourself. You can just try and throw yourself into a situation that you'd never normally be in and just write about it. You can even just think about it, to be honest, but try and try and um, put yourself in the, in the shoes of someone else. I, I often get people, for example, I often, when I'm doing the training, um, get people to put their hand up if they've never, never been in a betting shop. So I don't know, you know, who's, who's on the call now, but just think to yourself, if you, if you've ever been to a betting shop or not, I'm guessing about half of you won't have. Honestly, it's a really interesting exercise. Set yourself the task of going into a betting shop, having a conversation in there because I want you to place a bet, right? You can place a bet for 50p, so this won't cost you anything, right? But if you've never been to a betting shop before, go and place a bet for 50p. You'll have to talk to people because you don't know how to do it. And what you'll find is that the betting shop is nothing like what you thought it was. And the people in there are nothing like you thought they were. And the people behind the counter are not like you thought they were. It's, it's a really good little challenge. Um, but anybody could do I also do get, get people to go to a mosque. If you've never been to a mosque before, go to a mosque. And you'll find it's nothing like you thought it was. Um, th these kinds of little kind of challenges to yourself, I think, are really interesting exercises. Sorry, I'm, I'm also just trying to look in the uh, chat exercise. Can, can I just... Um, just to finish off my my sort of my, my spiel so that's that's all the training in the wig and deal part i just want to say as well that ethnographic research and anthropological research does have other applications and, and i use it throughout my work not only for um this training purposes i i think if you're a manager using ethnographic research as a researcher does it so not not as social workers putting it into practice but as a researcher does that ethnography um, has a number of uh, very, very valuable applications. And it's, it, it, you know, to do with things like reframing challenging problems. I mean, actually, you've got a quote from Margaret Mead on, um, on the front of the HCAN thing, describing this exactly, about the seemingly unsolvable problems. This is precisely what you throw ethnographers at. So I've often worked on wicked issues, difficult things, with difficult to reach groups and what have you. That's one thing. Um, it can challenge um, exactly what you were talking about, Heather, the kind of institutional uh, malaise, if you like, the, the kind of falling back on institutional processes. Ethnography is very good at challenging those things and getting people to break out of them. It also creates very powerful stories. So if you're working in a community and you want to persuade a senior manager, we need to do things differently, ethnography will provide you with these very powerful stories um, for why we might need to change. Um, it, it can be used. I, in Wigan, we got rid of the engagement function in the council. Why? Because if everybody's working in this way, you don't need an engagement function anymore because the whole council is doing engagement all the time. Um, so I think you can, you can, yeah, it can, it can be part of your co-design engagement processes. I, I think once you're working ethnographically, you don't, you don't need other things like that. Um, and it can be used for innovation. That's a whole big talk. To, I, a lot of my career is doing innovation yeah. and coming up with new things. It, it, it gives you new insights. Anyway, I just wanted to finish that a little bit off. I'm noticing there's a lot of comments in chat. Well, yeah, yeah. One of them was about uniform, and I, I agree. I have to think really carefully, and I don't know whether anybody else does, about how I appear when, because I do a lot of asset-based community development work, and I think really carefully about what I wear, um, whether I want to blend in or stand out, you know, in schools, I wear uniform because uh, I'm talking to pupils about generally respiratory. That's what I do these days. Um, and um, when I was working in Salford, I, I wore, I tried to blend in as, as much as possible. Um, and you get treated differently as well. Um, have you got any advice about being that, that native, trying to look at things from a native perspective and, how best to blend in to do that? Yeah, I mean, you, so uniforms are, are, are a problem if you're going to do this. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I remember do, doing this many years ago with leaders from um, Norfolk Council and we were getting them to do, to do this kind of thing. And um, it, it, there was one guy, you know, we were going into a, um, a housing estate that had problems with antisocial behaviour and what have you. And the chief of police was supposed to be doing this and he turned up in his uniform and we literally said, you can't do this. You've got to go home and change um, because no one's going to speak to you in, 
in any kind of naturalistic way while you're wearing, you know, medals and all this. Stuff. Absolutely ridiculous. Um, and, and actually, the chief exec also turned up in heels and we, we, we had to talk to her and she went to the shop and bought a pair of slip-ons because um, we're just like, again, you're just not having conversations with people if you're, if you're setting up that barrier straight mm. away, setting up a set of um, pre presumptions um, in both your minds, to be honest. And, and there's a power relationship. That, that's what a uniform does. It, it, um, it evokes power relationships that you want to try and get away from if you, if you want to get technical about it. So the best thing to do is just wear your normal clothes and just be yourself. People often say, do, do I change myself? Well, you sort of do, but not in the way that people are thinking. Like the, the worst thing I could do is go into some kind of situation and pretend that I don't have a middle-class accent. People would sniff that out in a second. Of course, I've got a middle-class accent. I'm going to speak with a middle-class accent. I'm just going to speak very openly, and I'm going to let them speak. And it's amazing how quickly, once you've given people the space and time to talk, they will forget who you are. Because, yeah. yeah. I, think it's, I think it's the authenticity. I go to places mm -hmm. where the community is really alienated from mm -hmm. their own services and also my experience is that it can take about six months before they'll really tell me what's going on and sometimes they won't tell me at all um, I'll, I'll experience it I'll watch it I'll see it but what they actually say to me takes six months and quite often I'll, I'll work with a trusted uh, local person as a guide um, and they'll tell mm -hmm. that local person and they'll tell me and then Mm -hmm. slowly they'll introduce me and they'll say she's all that what they mostly say about me in Salford is she's all right really <laughs> it's the best I can hope yeah. for <laughs> yeah yeah no that's good yeah and, and funnily enough that is exactly the way that professional anthropologists do it obviously when when I was doing my PhD my field work it takes two years right um and and that's exactly how people do it they go with a with someone trusted at first we call them informants um which doesn't work <laughs> we can't, can't don't use, use that, that word <laughs> um, but um but but yeah that that's exactly how we do it trusted intermediaries are a good way to get into people's lives i, I noticed Anne also asked that question about um respecting people's privacy and what have you and I, I, that's a complicated question. So th there are anthropological ethical guidelines, and you can look these up um, about, about what you do. My practical sense is if somebody is really, really private and rejecting what you're doing, you, you just don't do it. You just, you just back out of that situation. But I think there is something about taking time over this and allowing people to understand that you are a safe person to talk to. Um, I often, when, when I'm doing my ethnography nowadays, I sometimes warn people at the beginning of the day, I'm like, I'm going to take your consent to talk to you now, um, but I'm going to check in with you um, throughout the day and make sure that consent still stands. Because what will happen is you will tell me things that you don't think you're going to tell me right now. And they, 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 they you know, I, I've done this a lot. So people think, you know, I won't tell him about, I don't know, I was abused as a child but they will end up telling me that because I do this all the time and they're not used to somebody who is just listening and the stuff pours out uh, and Nem is written similar things down there um yeah stuff will pour out to people once you become that kind of blank no assumptions no power relationship no agenda people will pour out things to you um, so yeah the, the consent I think is really important to, to make sure that you, you get it at the beginning but you get it towards the end as well to, to remind them that they've now told you this stuff um uh, th there is incidentally th there's a whole i you know i run a whole day's session on how to do the ethics of, of all this because there, there's a difference between the ethics that a researcher has and the ethics that a professional uh, on the front line has um we, we we don't follow the same rules and we need sometimes we need to work out which rules we're following in which context mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, the other the other technique that I tend to use is um, to to just be the most helpless. I've said this before, the most helpless nurse in the place. And I go, how do you do that? Yeah, and yeah. I need help to do this. How do yeah. I? How do I? How do I arrange yeah. this Halloween party? This was about showing the father's strengths, you know. And um, and they go, you don't want to go there. And they just yeah. sort of laugh at me and, you know, and they go, yeah. oh, no, you don't want to go there because um, that's one gang's patch. 
Um, and you don't want to go over here to that gang's patch. You want to be here on this road here because it's neutral. It's neutral turf. Yeah. And, and I just take it all and I say, I can't possibly do this. I need your help. Oh, I need, you know, um, that tends to work quite well, you know. <laughs> the, <laughs> They're quite it, confused so the, by yeah, having a, such the, a helpless woman. Um, yeah, the, 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 technical, the technical term for that is sort of faux naivety, right? And it's a very good tactic. So somebody says, you, you know that Game of Thrones, you know that Game of Thrones. And, and, you're just, and even if you watch every episode, you're, you're like... I've heard about what what is it again and you get them to tell you this is the whole thing about seeing the world from the natives point of view and yes that that kind of fake helplessness is a, is a, a really good term. technique I'm happy now <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh and ne Nem is just referencing um the stand up sit down exercise that I use to warm people up where I get people to stand up if they've got tattoos but that's a whole other whole other discussion yeah asking um, people about their tattoos is a really good approach yeah, to get is, to know people yeah yeah it is, it is it'll take you a long time by the way some, some parts of great manchester yeah. yes any last questions for robin uh we're slightly over but we started slightly late yeah power relationships yeah wow so any other recommendations for particularly for students who may be watching or university lecturers who are thinking about how to put this into their their courses really <clears throat> any any top tips yeah i mean i, I think interestingly uh, that um one, one thing i should mention is that, that trying to roll out these kinds of approaches is different in different institutions so uh, my, my thinking is so, so for example adult social care there's a whole raft of things that go on in so adult social care where all of this fits very well and actually you could just incorporate it as part of um, i mean you know there are anthropology departments and universities just go and do some guest guest lectures you know just a bit of cross fertilization in a in a university would work they, they perfectly complement there's no there's no worry if you're training to be a social worker absolutely go go to the anthropology department get them to help um and they, they'd love to do that i think it's much more difficult in the in the nhs um the biomedical medical model is um king and qualitative research methods are seen as kind of woolly and fluffy and lesser <laughs> and uh, th th there's a problem uh, generally with rolling this out and i think there are parts of nursing where this fits perfectly and other parts of nursing where you have a real struggle uh, and and on on the, because you've got so many other things to do um and different protocols to adhere to but i think the i I think being curious at this point about how we better engage with people and start to understand a new medical paradigm is emerging, which is around management of or health creation and, and, and uh, people living with chronic diseases and what have you, which is not going to be the same as the old medical paradigm of present with an acute illness, get cure. Um, I think there's some interesting things happening, but, but it's going to be a longer road in the, on the medical side. Of things. I, th I think that interdisciplinary I think uh, quite a lot of universities now do the interdisciplinary work and they call in the different departments um, mm -hmm. to deliver parts of the curriculum. And I think that's also very, very valuable. Um, you've got some comments to read through there. Um, generally, that's been quite um, awe-inspiring, really. And uh, I think several people will be knocking on the doors of Wigan and Berry Council. <laughs> <laughs> To try to try to access some training if there are local authorities, you may be getting some more work from this. I don't know. Um, but yeah. um, for now, Robin, thank you so much for being our guest. Uh, we will be looking up the Balinese cockfight. We'll all we'll all be doing that. If there's any other suggestions for reading, then please do um, send them to us. Um, our next um, session um, is with um, Dave Thompson and uh, with George Field Fielding around housing disability and assisted living. Um, so that will be on the ooh, 16th, of, uh, 16th of January, 10 to 11.30. So I'll advertise that. But for now, thank you so much, Robin. And uh, the recording will be out soon. Thank you. All thank right you. then, bye. Okay.